It's my great pleasure today to welcome back to Harvard and to the South Asian Religions Colloquium, Dr. James Mallinson, who is Senior Lecturer in Sanskrit and Classical Indian Studies at SOAS in the University of London. Dr. Mallinson earned his BA in Sanskrit and Old Iranian at the University of Oxford, followed by an MA in Area Studies South Asia with ethnography as his main subject at SOAS. His doctoral thesis, which was submitted to Oxford, was a critical edition and annotated translation of the Kachari Vidya, an early text of Hatha Yoga, published in 2007 by Rutledge. Since then, Dr. Mallinson has been incredibly productive. He's published a seven additional books, all of which are editions and translations of Sanskrit yoga texts, epic tales, and poetry. His recent work has used philological study of Sanskrit texts, ethnography, and art history to explore the history of both yoga and yogic practitioners. His most recent book, written in collaboration with doc Dr. Mark Singleton, who's here with us today, is Roots of Yoga, published by Penguin Books this year. From 2015 to 2020, Dr. Mallinson is leading the European Research Council-funded research project on the history of Hatha Yoga, which will result in no fewer than 10 critical editions and translations of key yogic texts, four monographs, and two large conferences, one in 2017 and a, f a future one in 2019 to be held at SOAS. Dr. Mallinson's talk today is entitled, as you can see, Material and Textual Evidence for Links Between Buddhist and Shaiva Tantric Yogis in Western India in the 11th through 15th centuries. Please join me in welcoming back to the South Asian Religions Colloquium, Dr. James Mallinson. Uh, thank you very much, Anne, for that uh, very kind introduction. Also for asking me back again. It's good to be back. It, although it's a bit worrying how fast time flies. I was trying to work out, I think it's four or five years since I was here, which uh, has gone extremely fast. Um, so yes, this is what I'm going to talk about. The, the title's gone through a, a few changes. Uh, Konkan, it says now, and I, had, I think it was Western India that I sent you. Perhaps Western <laughs> India's more appropriate, sorry. And also you'll see that I've swapped around material and textual because uh, well, I'm going to talk to you about the textual side of things first. Uh, there's a very long handout. Uh, don't be too scared. I'm not going to uh, go through it in great detail. My God, and my eyesight's got a lot worse than five years ago as well. I need to put my glasses on just to look at the handout. Uh, there will only be a few bits that you really need to look at. Most of it will be on the screen. So yes, I'm going to start with the, the textual stuff and then hopefully about halfway through. I've got an hour or so, haven't I? About halfway or two-thirds of the way through, I will switch to the art historical materials uh, and uh, show a few photographs of, of sites that I've visited in India. Uh, it sort of takes a, a turn. It starts off quite well, that bit, but it really goes from the sublime to the ridiculous with some rather sort of um, hopeless attempts at field work at the end, but in, in some ways productive as well. Um, Okay, so the, the first thing I'm going to talk about is, I'm going to start to be working nicely, this text called the Amrita Siddhi, which um, some of you may know, I've, um, I've got a, uh, an article, I think it's almost in print, isn't it? Shaman's editing the, 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 the volume, that it's a festriff for uh, Professor Alexis Sanderson, in which I show how this text, which, so I'll, 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 I'll just take you through it. The, these, the, the text, the Amrita Siddhi, means something like the attainment of immortality. <coughs> and I first got hold of manuscripts of it, it must be 15 years ago, something like that. Uh, and there were, there were manuscripts in the NGMPP, so the, the uh, Kathmandu-based, uh, now defunct, well not defunct, probably not the wrong word, but now stopped project. And also there's two manuscripts from uh, Jodhpur in Rajasthan. And so I was reading them, uh, it was the, the Rajasthani ones I got hold of first, and it became quickly became apparent that this is a really important um, sort of root text of, of Hatha Yoga, of physical yoga practice. Um, it introduces various uh, principles and techniques that, that for the first time, which then get uh, repeated in lots of um, subsequent texts, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. Um, now, from those manuscripts from Rajasthan, and also from these Nepali manuscripts, um, you know, I concluded, I, you know, it, in order to fit it into the general picture, the general understanding of the history of Hatha Yoga, uh, I thought it was a Shaiva text, and there are features about the text that, that make it uh, seem as though it's Shaiva. Um, 
there's, I think there's various references on the handout. Curtis Schaefer actually was the first person to bring the text to, to public attention. He wrote an article on it in 2002. And he based, well, I'll actually jump forward to, he based that uh, article on this manuscript, which is uh, uh, unique. Well, uh, apparently it's not unique. He thought it at the time, and I used to think it was unique, but apparently there are a few more manuscripts like this, which are bilingual uh, Tibetan and Sanskrit. And so we've got three registers. Um, the top register is the Sanskrit text in probably a Nepali hand. Uh, then the second register is the same Sanskrit text, but in uh, Tibetan, uh, I'll get this wrong, see, I don't know Tibetan, Ume, one of the scripts called Ume, someone can correct me, and then the cursive script underneath, so this one, uh, that is actually a translation of the Sanskrit into Tibetan. Uh, this manuscript, which was obtained by Professor Leonard van der Kuyp from here in Harvard, uh, is dated at the end, 1160. Um, <coughs> so, and then I also managed to get hold of some South Indian manuscripts. So we've got three Grunter manuscripts of the text as well. Uh, now, over the last, well, we finished a year or two ago, but in Oxford I've been reading with Peter Santo uh, the text using this manuscript. I'd already produced a kind of working edition with Professor Sanderson, but that was before we got hold of uh, these scans. And then uh, over a year or so, read the text using this manuscript with Peter Santo and also Anand Venkat Krishnan, who's, who's here, and various others uh, in Oxford. And it slowly became apparent that uh, the text was written by Buddhists, not, not Shaivas. And there are various reasons for this, which I outline in the, uh, the article that I mentioned. Um, and I'll summarize. I think there's a couple are given here. Um, and I'm going to just show you, sort of quickly, whiz through four of those, uh, just to sort of fill in the philological background. What's, what we seem to have, uh, the, so the, this manuscript, which I call manuscript C, give it the siglum C, is the represents sort of older stage of the text. Then the uh, South Indian manuscripts represent sort of intermediate, intermediate stage. And then these, the, the texts that are mainly in sort of forms of Devanagari, the uh, Nepali and Rajasthani manuscripts that form a, a sort of later stage in the development of the text. And so the, um, hang on, where are we? Okay, well, I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, sorry, I should have uh, <coughs> I've done this slightly in the wrong order, but the key practices and principles that are introduced within the text, which we then find in quite a lot, but not all subsequent texts on Hatha Yoga, and I'll talk about that a bit more, are this notion of the yogic body having within it the sun, the moon, and fire. So there's this idea that, um, and then and bindu, you see there. Bindu is, is semen, and that's meant to be produced in the head, and is then drip, dripping down uh, through the central channel, and is consumed by the fire uh, at the bottom of the central channel. Um, and, the, and also there's this notion that there are three grunties, three knots, uh, um, along the central channel, that bindu and the breath, when they rise, they have to pierce those three knots. Uh, there are three practices used for doing that. There's Mahamudra, Mahabandha, and Mahaveda. So they're a sort of their physical uh, positions. In fact, the third one, Mahaveda, is is dynamic. You actually have to lift yourself up and drop yourself down, and that seems to that's a piercing, Veda a piercing. That makes the breath shoot up through the central channel. Uh, something else that it introduces is connection between the mind, um, breath, and bindu. The three are, you know, if you can control one, then you can control the rest of them. So the, the principle, these, the practices are said to work on breath, and as a result, uh, through being able to control the breath, then you can control bindu. And then it also introduced these four states, uh, the progression of states as you advance through yoga practice, arambha, nkakta, paricheya, and nishpati, uh, and finally four levels of aspirant. Um, and there's a whole load of text, but I'll go into this in more detail later on, but it's right through to this uh, Hatha Pradipika Jyotsna, which is a commentary on Hatha Pradipika written in, I think it's 1837. That cites, cites the text, um, cites the Amrita Siddhi. Now, the Buddhist features are, I'm not, as I say, I'm not going to list all of them. If you, if, you're, if you want to see more of it, look in the, um, my article, which is on academia.edu, a draft version of it anyway. Now, on the handout, you'll see on the first page the Mangala verse, which is found uh, only in C and in the, uh, the southern manuscripts. Okay. And then this Mangala verse is to Chinnamastha, the goddess Chinnamastha. And 
you'll see in the apparatus that actually the, the South Indian manuscripts don't understand Chinnamastam. They, they spell it wrong. They have Chinnabhastam and Chittahastam. So they don't really know what's going on. They don't know what to do with, with Chinnamastam. But Chinnamastam, um, and I've given some references here to articles by uh, Gudrun Buneman and Alexis Sanderson, until the 16th century, when she becomes well known. So this image is from you know, one of the sets of the Dasha Mahavidyas, the ten goddesses of, of, uh, of um, uh, tantrism in, very popular in, in Bengal, in East India, by the 16th century. But prior to that, she only occurs within uh, tantric Buddhist texts. Um, and then, what do we have next? Oh, sorry, I could have put that up. We could have looked at that. So I've got about 100 slides, and I haven't quite remembered what order they're all in. Um, yes, yeah, so here's another uh, thing. That, that, it was great reading this text with Peter because there are all these things that when I read it before, I'd sort of skip over and maybe the, the later manuscripts wouldn't understand it or they'd change it and I wouldn't really understand why. But Peter Santo is a very uh, expert in tantric Buddhism, so he would in instantly recognize all these things and explain to me what was going on. <clears throat> and I've had to do a sort of crash course in, in, in tantric Buddhism as a result, but it's still extremely obscure. But I'm slowly getting there. Anyway, one of these, th this verse here, which is, uh, actually I don't give it in the handout, uh, but verse 7-4, to ananda ye prakatyante viramanta hasharirataha, tepi bindud bhavaha sarve jyotsna chandra bhava yatha. So it's talking about the, the blisses, the anandas, viramantaha, which, whose last, whose anta, whose final is virama, the bliss of cessation. Now, these are the four sequential blisses in uh, the sexual rituals of, of, of Tantric Buddhism. Virama is the final one, the bliss of cessation. Okay, and then it's saying that they all arise from Bindu, which I guess is sort of fairly obvious, I suppose, or there's a, a clear connection. Uh, but what um, the text itself, the Amrita Siddhi, does not prescribe sexual ritual. It's very much a kind of a text for celibate yogis. It's insistent on the preservation of Bindu, unlike uh, the... Um, the manuals, you know, the, the, the paddhatis of uh, tantric Buddhist ritual sexual practice. <coughs> okay, and then there's another verse here, 6.2, uh, prithivyadini chatvari vidrutam pratak pratak. Uh, then the key thing is prithivyadini chatvari. So this is talking about the four tattvas, the four elements. So in, in Buddhist tradition, in tantric Buddhism, there are four elements, but of course in uh, Shaiva um, traditions, there are five. So the later manuscripts all change Chatwari to Tatwari. Um, keep going through that. And then I think this is the last example I'm going to give. This, this completely bamboozled me when I was first uh, reading the, the later manuscripts, this talk of this Swadesh Tana yoga. And in fact, you can see as well that um, the later manuscripts were equally confused by this reference. So you see where they have, uh, so we've got Swadesh Tana yogena yasya chittam prasadyate. Shilam Charvati Mohena Trishitaha Kam Vibhatyapi. So um, he whose mind uh, is mastered or tries to be mastered, I suppose is understood, by means of the Swadishtana yoga, uh, it's as if he is um, trying to chew on a rock, Shilam Charvati, in, in delusion, Mohena, or thirsty, Trishitaha, he's um, trying to drink the sky. And now <coughs> you can see that the later manuscripts all, put, all change Yogena to Margena. And this is, you know, my instant reaction. You know, if you if you know about Hatha Yoga and the, the, the sequence of the chakras and so forth, and the and the rising of Kundalini, you'll think of Swadhisthana as a location within the body. It's the second chakra from the the, the base of the of the central channel. Um, <coughs> but within Tantric Buddhism, Swadhisthana Yoga is what's normally translated as Deity Yoga, where the sadhaka. Um, imagines himself, recreates himself as whichever deity it is that he's trying to invoke. Now what the, the Amrita Siddhi is saying is that this deity yoga practice actually is, uh, doesn't get you anywhere and you need to do these three techniques that it teaches, the Mahamudra, Mahapanda and Mahaveda. So it may be a tantric Buddhist, come from a tantric Buddhist tradition, but it's sort of out on a limb, it's an eccentric tantric Buddhist tradition because it distances itself from, from all the others. Uh, and I, d I don't need to go through the next one, I don't think. So <coughs> Now this, what I'm going to talk about now, so this is sort of old news to me. Now the last few weeks, now I'm going to try to present something which I'm not sure I've got totally straight myself, so please do stop me if I'm being uh, not clear. But 
if any of you who who know my work on hatha yoga will know that I what I normally the way I normally sort of try to analyze it I talk about early hatha yoga because the first definition of hatha yoga that we get is in a text called the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra and in that text hatha yoga practice is characterized by uh, the use of these techniques which are later classified as mudras so they're various physical techniques for manipulating the the vital energies and then uh, in so that text is probably 13th century and then in the 15th century the te a text called the Hatha Pradipika which sort of widens Hatha Yoga into these mudras and these complex asanas, complex physical postures, uh, uh, complicated methods of breath control, the cleansing practices and also listening to the internal sound. So that I sometimes call classical Hatha Yoga. But what, what, um, what I'm going to do here is actually look at where, and, and so there are various texts before the 15th century Hatha Pradipika which teach mudras and teach some of these other practices, but don't call it Hatha Yoga. And I've always just sort of bunched them under, the, under this rubric of Hatha Yoga. But if one, what I'm doing here is looking at the actual usage of the phrase, the word Hatha Yoga. Now, the first instances are all in uh, Vajrayana, Tantric Buddhist texts. Okay? And this was first uh, pointed out uh, in an article published in 2011 by my colleague Jason Birch. And he, he, I, he identified the, oh, sorry, the typo there. It should be Guhya Samaja Tantra. Um, and he, I, don't, I think it's eight of these, and, and Peter actually is, has, uh, has given me four more, including the earliest one. And this one's very interesting, very obscure text, very hard to make sense of, which Peter's got a, uh, a very thorough uh, working edition, nearly ready to be published, of the Sarva Buddha Sama, Sama Yoga Dhaka Nijala Samvara, which actually has seven references to Hatha Yoga in it. And then we have all these subsequent um, Tantric Buddhist texts you see ranging from early 8th century to about 1200. Now I won't go through them, but now I'm going to the next slide. Uh, most of those texts they don't specify what hatha yoga is. It's used in various contexts, and it's something I need to work through. To be honest, I haven't I haven't analysed in particularly those that first one that Peter's just uh, told me about. Um, but where we do get definition, we get three sort of definitions. The most detailed is this one in. Pundarika's uh, Vimla Prabha, which is a commentary on the um, Kala Chakra Tantra. And there, I won't read it all out, but it's, um, it's, it's equated with forcefully making the breath flow in the central channel through the practice of Nada, uh, and then um, restraining the bindu, i.e. the semen uh, of the bodhicitta, uh, in the vajra when it is in the lotus of, wis of wisdom, i.e. during sexual ritual. So it's, stopping ejaculation during sexual ritual. And this is, and then in the, um, in the Seka Nirdesha, which is, uh, I think it's 11th century, isn't it? Um, and then there's quite extensive uh, exegesis on that by um, Ramapala and Maitreya Natha, which has been brilliantly uh, analyzed and presented by Haru Isaacson and Francesco Sfera in a recent huge, beautiful volume called the, which known colloquially as the Red Brick. Um, <laughs> And in that, it's very clear that the that Hatha Yoga is defined as the reversal of the last of the of the third and fourth of the blisses of tantric sexual ritual. Uh, what isn't clear is what that actually means in practice. Um, and I'm guessing that again, it's related to what goes on in uh, in, in the Vimala Prabha, how it's explained. Perhaps you know that it's uh, that you don't. You don't reach the virama stage, or somehow the virama stage. So virama meaning cessation uh, can also mean, you know, vir, the prefix vir has various ways of being interpreted. So it can intensify. So it can mean uh, increased pleasure. So I'm wondering if if that is what's intended. Anyway, it seems to um, refer to not ejaculating during the sexual ritual. <coughs> and then finally, there's a there's a uh, here in the in the Yogi Manohara Panchakrama Tippani. Uh, it's associated with controlling the breath. Um, now, I shall move on. So now I'm going to look at pre-15th century texts which mention Hatha Yoga, non-Buddhist texts. And what you'll notice is they all post-date the Buddhist ones. Okay. Uh, now, Jason, when he wrote his article in 2011, we didn't know about the Amrita Siddhi you know, being a Buddhist text. And we also thought that, well, he thought, and I, but I worked with him quite, you know, with, worked with him on that article a bit. Um, 
we assumed that within Shiva text we'd probably find Hatha Yoga and that this is sort of anomalous, but it's become increasingly clear that no, I mean, there are no Shaiva texts which, uh, so Shaivaga, I'm saying before, you know, from the corpus of, of Shaiva tantras, Hatha Yoga is never mentioned. And its first mentions appear in, the dates here are fairly, you know, give or take a century or two, but I think probably the earliest one is Amaraga Prabodha. And these are a, a sequence of what we would then understand as Hatha Yoga texts. Um, the Amaraga Prabodha is interesting in that it takes the, it reworks the Amrita Siddhi very closely, but reframes it in a clearly Shaiva context and also introduces the raising of Kundalini, which you don't find in the, in the Amrita Siddhi. Um, <coughs> now, you'll see in this, so of these one, two, five, and six, so not the Yoga Bija and the Aparokshana Guti, they don't give, they just mention Hatha Yoga. But the ones that actually teach the practices, okay, they all include this thing, this, this practice called Vajroli Mudra, which is a technique of urethral suction, which is again a method of stopping ejaculation. Now, my suspicion, and I've actually um, I got an article about to go into print on Vajroli Mudra. Now, I'm reasonably certain that that also uh, developed within Tantric Buddhist traditions. I mean, the name is a bit of a giveaway, Vajroli. Uh, I have spoken to, I mean, we. The thing is, there's a hell of a lot more to be learned about Tantric Buddhism. And Harunaga Isaacson, in an article of his, I think he estimates that uh, of the 2,000 known texts on Tantric Buddhism, only 300 have been looked at and uh, analyzed. And also, I gave a, a talk at um, UVA, <coughs> I think it was last year, talking to David Germano, and he was convinced. He said, look, there's loads of 11th, 12th century Tibetan texts which, which talk about Vajrayi Mudra, but no one's you know, bothered to look at them properly. Um, so it's slightly conjectural, but my, my thinking is that here, I've just gone back a slide, so when we're talking about, you know, when Pundarika is talking about restraining the bindu of the bodhicitta in the Vajra, presumably, you know, the method is not specified, and I'm wondering if perhaps that's Vajroli Mudra, because in these four explanations of, of Hatha Yoga, these four texts which, which teach Hatha Yoga, you get Vajroli Mudra, you get the three mudras taught in the Amrita Siddhi. Now, uh, an interesting point is that Amrita Siddhi does not call its yoga hatha. Okay, it doesn't call it anything. It just you know, t teaches yoga. Uh, but you get, so in these, these, these teachings on hatha yoga, which come soon after the Amrita Siddhi, uh, you get Vajrayi mudra, and then you get these, these sort of characteristic features of the Amrita Siddhi's yoga. The three mudras, the four avastas, and the four levels of aspirin. And you don't get them in any other early Hatha Yoga texts. You know, none of the other texts which teach any of these mudras which later get classified as, as Hatha Yoga have, have uh, any of this stuff. So to me, this is, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is I'm pretty convinced now that Hatha Yoga in its early incarnations was a direct sort of derivation from these tantric Buddhist traditions. <coughs> okay, now what's my next slide? Sometimes you can be clever and you can see what's coming, can't you? But that would help me. Uh, and this is just some slightly sort of um, tangential evidence as well. There's a text I'm going to talk a little, talk a bit more about. It's a Telugu text called the Navanata Charitra, so the deeds of the nine Nats by someone called Garana, written in about 1400. And he says that when Matsyendra, that, that Matsyendra, who's the first of the human Nats, and I'll talk a lot more about him in a minute, uh, taught one of his disciples, Chaurangi Anuttariya Yoga. Okay, and that's a you know, that's something we don't get in, mentioned in Hatha Yoga texts or in Shaiva texts, but it's a, I mean, anyone who knows anything about Tantric Buddhism will know that that's a, you know, that's a, a key term in, 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 in Tantric Buddhism. And similarly, this is a very sort of vague, sketchy reference I found, but it, apparently within the, the Dharma, uh, Dharma Mangala traditions of Bengal as well, this is a, a scholar writing on their oral traditions, he's called Nagendra Nath Vasu, and uh, he says that, um, he seems to equate Anuttara Yoga and Hatha Yoga. There's something I only discovered yesterday, I think, or the day before, so I need to chase that one up a bit, but that's sort of tangential evidence. Okay, so that's the... Oh, is there a clock on there? Oh, yeah, I think that's right. Turn. I'll turn my phone off, that's too sensible. And what, how, what's the time? It's in the... Oh, there's a clock on there. 3.35. Okay, so I'm doing okay. Um, <coughs> so the teachings on... Uh, the teachings of the Amrita Siddhi are attributed to Virupa. So yes, having established this, what, you know, then my, 
my uh, curiosity is peaked as to you know, where was this going on? What's the actual context of this? Um, where were these? Um, how, how did this transition between Buddhist tantric yogis and and Nath yogis? Because most of those actually, yeah, something I should have said here. Uh, the Amaragra Prabodha, and I will show that in a minute. That's a Nath text. The Mangalas in that, and, and I, I said it. It takes the Amrita Siddhi's teachings, refashions them, inserts Kundalini, and at the beginning has a uh, an invocation to various Nath gurus, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the Yoga B, well, the Hatha Pradipika has some Nath mentioned. The Shiva Sangita, in fact, and Data Tre Yoga Shastra are not Nath texts. Um, but yeah, so how did this transition from Tantric Buddhists to Hindu yogis come about. Um, so I, the first place to start is to look into Virupa, because the teachings on these practices, and there's a much more extensive cycle, in fact, of Amrita Siddhi teachings in Tibetan, all attributed to Virupa. And one thing I should add as well is that Peter has discovered, uh, only in Tibetan, a text called the Amrita Siddhi Mula, which has the, the key practices, so the Mahamudra, Mahabandha, Mahaveda, uh, and it seems that that was probably that probably existed before the the the, the, the longer Amrita Siddhi text, and those those teachings are you know included in these cycles, uh, and they're all attributed to Virupa. Now, and Virupa is a well-known uh, tantric siddha, occurs in both um, Shaiva and Buddhist lists. Uh, this is a 16th-century picture. I mean, he's the one who's famous for uh, being in the tavern, isn't he? And he wants to keep drinking, and the so, you know, sun setting, and he points at the sun and stops the sun from setting, so he's allowed to keep drinking. <laughs> and the publican can't call last orders, as we, as we would say in England. Uh, now, look, trying to look into where, but I, and I've got, given you quite a few references on the handout to him in Siddha text, I think it's on page three of the handout, um, but he, he occurs very little within the Nath tradition, but he does occur only, only early on. He seems to disappear around about 15 around about the 15th or 16th century. Uh, and one of the places he does appear within the Nath tradition is in this text that I mentioned earlier called the, the Navanata Charitra. Um, so he's included them in those nine Naths. And this is a very interesting text. I don't read Telugu, so uh, I ha I'm indebted to um, Professor Prabhavati Reddy, who I who uh, met with a, a few times and, and talked this through. And I believe some other people are working on it. So it's a, it's a sort of... A, a, a new um, exciting field of research this sort of trans these uh, parallels with well these links between yoga uh, the Nath tradition Vera Shaivas and so forth and this Sri Shailam is a you know a real center for where this this would have happened now in this Navanata Charitra among the nine Naths we've got Virupaksha so Virupa Virupaksha the, the interchangeable names um, I've also highlighted Manjunatha and Buddha Siddha now uh, Virupaksha, he's meant to have gone off to Karnataka, that's what it says in the Navanata Charitra. After he's received his teachings, he goes west to Karnataka. Um, Matsyendra, there's a famous legend which you may know of, of Matsyendra, who is the first human guru of the Nath order. He's the, his first disciple is Goraksha, Gorak Nath, you know, to whom many Hatha Yoga texts are attributed. Uh, he is said to have got uh, stuck in Kadali Desha, it's normally called. There were various, from various different parts of India, various different legends uh, in all sorts of languages. And this is the land of women. He's ensnared there by the queen, uh, and he kind of forgets his, his yogic heritage. And, uh, and he, it, within this legend, in the Navanata Charitra, by the queen of Kadali Desha, which is located on the western shore, it says, so somewhere on the west coast, their son is Manjunatha. So remember that, Manjunatha. And also there's these, um, mentioned, there's the stories of Buddha Siddha, who's a minister at the court uh, in Andhra, where, where the, 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 the Navanata Charitra is set. Um, <clears throat> and I think I make a note about this somewhere in the, in the handout. Uh, okay, so uh, this is just to go back to the Amaraga Prabodha, which I keep mentioning. And this is a text we're editing as part of the project, the Hatha Yoga project. Uh, there are two recensions we've identified. It has been published, a diplomatic transcript of one manuscript of the text was published by Kalyani Malik in 1954, but that's the long recension. Uh, in the manuscripts we've got, there's also a short recension, 
And they open, as I said, with these uh, Mangala verses to these uh, Nath yogis, uh, including Siddha Buddha, who I think you know, must be Buddha Siddha, must be the same, the, the same character. Um, and what have we got next? And also in the Hatrapadipika, which for various reasons, which I won't go into now, but I, th I think is pr was probably put together because it's a composition. This is from the 15th century, and we've identified uh, at least 20 texts which it borrows from. Uh, it was put together in the 15th century, probably in Andhra as well, I'm, I think it's fairly likely. And it gives a list of, I think it's 30 odd Siddhas, including Guru Paksha and Siddha Buddha. Um, okay, now, so this, I mean, the, the Viru, Virupa or Virupaksha's trail goes cold here. There's no more mentions of him in any Nath text subsequent to this. Oh, actually, no, in, in one text, uh, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, but there's this. So now, uh, now I'm going to talk about this place, Kadri. Now we get we, now we get onto sort of not quite holiday snaps, but you know fieldwork pictures. Um, and Kadri seems to be is clearly a site is the most clear cut site of uh, tantric Buddhist and Nath interaction. And it, it seems to be very likely that it's the Kadri Desha that's referred to in the Navanata Charitra and various other texts. Um, not least because the, if you remember that the, the son of Matsyendra and the queen of Kadli Desh was said to be Manjunatha, and there's this wonderful temple just outside Mangalore, Kadri is just outside, well, now part of Mangalore, uh, where the main image is, is called Manjunatha. Now, the main image now is a, is a rock, it's said to be a Swayambhu Linga, a form of Shiva, but to the, oh, sorry, yes, if I, there's a, there's a Mahatmya of the temple called the Kadli Manjunatha Mahatmya. So you see Kadli and Kadri are kind of interchangeable. Um, and that, that, this is the very last mention of Virupa we get in any Nart text. And it has the, a list of nine Nats, including uh, Virupaksha. Um, now, in, so if, if we, if the, the, the Garbhagruha, the central shrine is here. And so to the left, uh, is this wonderful? So this this is the sublime bit of the fieldwork. Okay, and so we're going to end up with the ridiculous. But the sublime bit um, is this murti, um, which is worshipped now as Brahma. Okay, but it's clearly I mean even someone even before I knew anything about this stuff, it's fairly clear to me that it was a a, a Buddhist deity. Now on the pedestal here is an inscription. Uh, and there's been a lot of analysis of this over the years by various local scholars, Kannada scholars in the, in the region. Um, it was thought to, the, to be dated 968, but actually there was some, some uh, d dispute about that. And Dominic Goodall uh, visited there earlier this year, and he's confirmed that actually what was, what was being read as a sh in shate was a gur for gate, and in fact the date is uh, 1068. Um, the pedestal also says that the image was set up by a Shaiva king, but for the Vihara, so for the, the, the monastery. You know, Vihara is only ever used for a Buddhist monastery, uh, and, this, and he installed an image of Lokeshwara. So everyone's always assumed that this is Lokeshwara. But on the other side of the central shrine, we've got these two beautiful bronzes as well. Um, now on the left, it's clearly a, a Buddha, but his worship is Vyasa. And on the right, we've got... Um, apparently Vishnu, but actually Manjushri, or most people identify this as Manjushri. And this is something I need to look into a bit more closely, but I've since been speaking to, in particular, a colleague at Soas Christian Luxonitz, who assures me that this is not Lokeshwara, this is Manjushri, okay? and that that is Lokeshwara or Avalokiteshwara. And what may well have happened, what, I, what we think has probably happened, is that they've been swapped around and that he was on the, that, uh, this location was on the pedestal, and at some point they've been moved around. And in fact, if one, we, there are photographs from earlier in the 20th century, and you can see that the images have been has, has been moved on the pedestal anyway. Um, <clears throat> now, above the temple, there's a, there's a small hill, and you walk up the hill, and there's this mutter, this monastery of uh, Nath yogis, okay, which is is very is thriving. Well, it's pretty quiet most of the time. But I visited it, um, this is March 2016, and every 12 years, it's, it's become it's an important site for the Nath yogis. And in fact, we have, from the 15th century onwards, reports of the, the king of the yogis who lives there, uh, and known as the Arasu yogi in Canada and the Raja yogi in, in 
Hindi or Sanskrit. And what happens now is every 12 years at the Nasik Kumbh Mela, a new king of the yogis is elected and a, a troop of three or four hundred um, Nath yogis walks barefoot for six months from Nasik down to Kadri and then on Shivaratri they install the, the, the new uh, king of the yogis. So this is just to show that it's still a very important centre for the Naths. Uh, it's, it was first kind of properly documented by Veronique Bouy, a French anthropologist who's done some excellent studies of it. Uh, and so she went to the one in 2004, and I then went back with my colleague Daniela uh, Bevilacqua last year. Um, now, <coughs> there are lots of shrines to various Nath Siddhas and Yogis within the Mata, uh, including to Matsyendra. So that's the, the white building there is the shrine to Matsyendra. Um, now, originally, it seems that this was the murti that was in that shrine. Now, this is now in the museum in Mangalore. Okay, pr maybe it got broken. I don't know, which is why it got moved there. Uh, now, this is Matsyendra. You can always tell Matsyendra because of the fish. That's not, that's not the clearest fish, but that is a fish that he's sitting on. Um, now, I was very intrigued to see this, to see the, the description of the date as 10th century, which seems very unlikely to me. I don't think it's nearly that old. Um, but, and it took me a while to understand what was going on there. And I, I've now realized that what's going on is it, it's the local scholars, because they know the date on Manjunata, on that, that oh, sorry, on the Lokeshwara image, or Lokeshwara, uh, is, well, they thought it was 10th century or 11th century. They can't countenance the fact that the Buddhists might have been there before the Shaivas. <laughs> and they argue very strongly. And, and some of them, you know, quite incredibly argue that the Lokeshwara and Manjushri images are not Buddhist, um, because they, you know, they, do, they don't like that. Um, but, so what have we got there? That, this, is the, this is the current image of Matsyendra in that shrine that I pointed out. So you can see it's pretty much the same. Uh, what's interesting, and this kind of, I'm just a little, slightly aside, it's sort of deviating from what I'm really talking about. But when I was here last and I was talking about these different lineages of, of yogis and how they developed, uh, what was particularly interesting for me to notice was that on the older image, you have this singhi. So this is a very characteristic symbol of the Nath yogi. Uh, this sort of small flute or whistle. And if we look in, uh, and then on the later image, it's a slightly different shape. Now, if we look at uh, Mughal miniatures of Nath yogis, we see the same thing going on. You can see their singhis there. I've got a close up there, so it looks very like the, the first one. And then in later images, and today, the Nath yogis wear a, a singhi of a very different shape, which is represented in these statues. So these are some. Some Nats at Jwalamukhi in Himachal Pradesh, and you can see that's the thing. So just to go back, you see this is a progression. So I'm sort of guessing that maybe these images are, are 14th, 15th century, the first one, and maybe 17th, 18th century, the, the second one. Now, sorry, to get back on track. Um, <coughs> so here in typical tantric Buddhist style or Buddhist iconography, we have a Dhyani Buddha in the Jakarmakutta of this Manjushri or Lokeshwara, whatever we want to call him. Um, now, this is not found in, in Hindu, you know, Shaiva iconography at all. But if you look on the, the Jata Mukutta of Matsyendra here, we can see one, which it seems that knows what seems to be going on is, is a direct development from this Lokeshwara or Manjunata, whoever it is, to Matsyendra. Um, I was looking at this the other day. I was trying to make sense of, of what it is on the headdress. And actually, I think now, just a few days ago when I was preparing this, I think actually it might be an image of, it might be this sort of image of Matsyendra with a yoga pata sitting on a, on, a, on a fish. One Pai, who's a Kannada scholar, he noticed this and he suggested it was Adinata, so the Shiva as the first, you know, the, the, the founding teacher of the, the Nath lineage. But I think, I think it's, I don't know, do you agree? It looks like it. Matsyendra on a fish. I think, I think it probably is. Anyway, I, Jason Birch, my colleague, is right today, he's just arrived in Mangalore, because this is the picture I got of Matsyendra, the new Matsyendra, or the more recent Matsyendra. And again, there's something there on his headdress, but my picture's terrible, I can't see anything at all. So I'm hoping he's going to sneak into the shrine and, and get a better shot, and we can find out what's going on. OK, uh, right, so that's, so there I think is a pretty clear cut um, development there from Tantric. Buddhism to, uh, yes, sorry, what I should have said here, sorry, I, I missed that out, but on, I've got a lot on the handout, uh, and I'm not going to, I don't think I've got time to go through it all, no, I'm not going to, um, 
But on the handout, there's a lot of textual references in, in, in quite a lot of detail. You can see basically what I've done here, I've sort of mapped out an article. Hopefully one day I'll get around to writing it up properly. Um, but pointing out how so the Pashtimam Naya stream of Kaula Shaivism, the Western transmission of Kaula Shaivism, uh, has got a close association with the Konkan, that, this region, and uh, that's uh, highlighted in various texts. I've given you some references to uh, Shotaman and, and Sanderson writing about that. Matsyendra, too, is also, I've given you various references there to Matsyendra being associated with the Konkan. Um, what I'll highlight here, I think it's interesting, is so Kshaba Kish, who edited the Matsyendra Sanghita, so this is a text associated with the, the teachings of Matsyendra. He uh, locates the text in the south, probably Tamil Nadu, he says, because of the mention of a god called Shastra, who is uh, uh, typically only a South Indian god. And he says in the text that, as far as he's aware, that Shastra is only attested in uh, Tamil Nadu, but in fact at the Mangalore Museum and there are several images of Shastra from the Kadri Mapa. So I'm, I'm now, I think it's more likely that the text itself was probably composed right, sorry, like back in, down in Kadri. Um, <coughs> and then you said in section seven I've given you lots of references to um, Tantric Buddhism. Scattered references, no one's, they've never been sort of put together. You can see I found them at some fairly obscure sources. In fact, Peter's helped me out with a few that he's he's noticed from Tibetan sources. But there is a you know a reasonable body of evidence of uh, of, of Vajrayana practice within the region. Um, and then section eight, uh, I refer to again uh, Jan Shoterman, who has looked into in the Shatsahasra Sanghita. Um, descriptions of interaction between uh, Tantric Buddhists and Nats. Uh, and there's a, a couple of passages which he, he doesn't include in, in his analysis, which I've uh, edited. They haven't, they're unpublished, actually, with, a, well, with a Alexis Sanderson. So you'll see these two long passages. And they include um, references to the region in which this happened. The first one, actually, the first one that I there, it's not in, the fir not in the first one, but in an alternate version given by Shotaman, uh, it's lo the, the interaction is located at a Chandragiri, which is almost certainly in Goa. Uh, and the second one mentions Arbuda, Mount Abu, so a bit further north, and I'll, go, I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, what we see, if you see at the beginning of section eight, I say how um, glasses, uh, it's always the kaulas who are instructing or initiating the boulders, with the exception of the second passage, in which at Abu, uh, a tantric, a Buddhist tantric yogi called Vajra Bodhi, um, is said to uh, instruct a collection of Nats. Now, I don't think this is the Vajra Bodhi. I think it's who, uh, in fact, Anne, you've written about Vajra Bodhi a little bit. I found some references in one of your books. Uh, but I think it's a bit too early, because he's seventh century, the one that's described in Chinese sources. So presumably, this is a, a later Vajra Bodhi. Um, and I think that's all I need to say about that. So yes, those are just extensive sources if anyone wants to pursue further. If anyone wants to tell me of more, I'd be delighted to hear. Um, OK, now, so I'm just going to now take you through a few more bits of field work, uh, trying to uh, identify other sites where this might have happened. Now, this place is wonderful, Panhale Kaji. So it's pretty near the coast of Maharashtra, about halfway between Bombay and Goa. Now there's an excellent monograph on it written uh, by, uh, what's his name, Deshpande, who was the head of the Archaeological Survey of India, and he published it in 1986. And again, I returned there with my colleague Daniela Bevilacqua last year, and it seemed, I don't think anyone's been there since. It seems very untouched. Um, and there's, a, there's 30 caves um, along a, a, a river, and the earliest of the, of the caves uh, dates to probably the third century, and they're, they're Hinayana, you know, old old Buddhist caves. They've got these sort of lovely kind of you know beds and uh, where where the where the monks would have lived, um, and there's lots to be shown there. But what's of particular interest is this cave ten uh, has this 11th century image of Achala, who's also known as Maharoshna, Chanda Maharoshna, you know, very uh, interesting tantric uh, Buddhist deity to whom some um, very antinomian practices and texts are attributed um, to the Chanda Maharoshana Tantra. And uh, as far as I'm aware, I think there's only one other image of Achala in India at Ratnagiri. Now, then, just in cave 14, we see a, 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 um, 
a progression to Nart Shaiva uh, traditions. So you see on the front of the cave there, we have these 12 um, siddhas. Now this seems to be a, uh, an, a very uh, early groupings of Nart seem to be in 12 as well, because I visited another site in uh, Gujarat, which I'm not going to show any pictures of, a place called Daboy, where we have 12 similar, well, they're much more detailed, but a similar grouping of 12 <coughs> Nats. But within this um, cave, we get this picture of Matsyendra, this carving of Matsyendra, so you see sitting on the fish with the, and again, it looks actually, look, I hadn't thought about that, it looks very like the, what's on the, the head of, um, of the Matsyendra from Kadri. And there we have uh, Shiva Adinata teaching Parvati the, the Kaula doctrine. So the, the legend is that there are various different forms of the legend, but basically Matsyendra overheard uh, Shiva teaching Parvati this, this, this doctrine and then taught it to the, the Nart, uh, his, his Nart disciples. And then also the other side of the hill, the hill behind where that sequence of caves are, there's another cave, Cave 29, uh, which has some similar carvings. Again, Matsyendra overhearing the doctrine. Uh, it also has, the, has carvings of 84 siddhas, which I think are the oldest in India. Um, I don't think you know, the oldest of, of a Shaiva tradition, or of any, any tradition in India, dated to the 14th century by Deshpande. I'm not sure on what grounds, but it uh, would make some sense. Also, we see here um, a, a, a carving of Tripura Sundari, who becomes around that period an important goddess for the, uh, the, the Nath tradition. <coughs> and I think that the AAR uh, Anya Golovkova is going to be speaking about iconography of um, Tripura Sundari, and she's going to talk a bit about this image as well. Um, okay, so that's Panhali Kaji. We've got a couple more places, and then I will, I, I'm, I'm done. Uh, this is a, another place. So you remember in the, in the last passage on the handout, um, the Vajrabodhi instructing the Nats, and that apparently happened in the Abu region, Mount Abu, which is just north of this place, Taranga, which uh, Mark and I and, and Daniela visited earlier this year. Uh, and it's well known for this 12th century uh, Jain temple, which apparently is the tallest Jain temple in India. Um, it's a very nice spot. But then we climbed up this hill because... We found some references in some literature to the cave of the yogis on the top of the hill, uh, and also some better attested uh, evidence of, of Buddhist practice there. So that's what would sort of piqued our interest. Now on the top of the hill, you see there are these three shrines, and the furthest left one is this one. And it's probably only 19th century or something, but you see these figures on the top, they're all clearly Nath yogis. Um, I'll show you a couple of them. Although, actually, I don't think I've included a picture of inside the shrine, but basically the Jains have taken over the whole area. And whatever was the image inside the shrine had been taken out, and we've got a Charan Paduka of one of the Jain Tirutankaras. Um, but then further, then the, the cave of the yogis took some finding. We nearly gave up, but eventually we got there. Uh, and it's in, in these, these boulders. This is the cave of the yogis, but you'll see the, the image there as well. We have these four, four Buddha, Dhyani Buddha images. Um, and then on the other side of the hill, here, are these, this very quiet, lovely spot where there are these two supposed goddess temples called Dharan Mata and Taran Mata is how they're known by the, by the local you know, Gujarati community. So these two temples next to each other. Now this is, um, this is Dharan Mata. Now it's fairly clear, well the, the images to the side of her are clearly Buddhist. And in fact, she is not a she at all, she's a he. There's no, no, nothing feminine about her iconography at all, but she's worshipped as, as a goddess. And then in the, the other, the temple next to her, we have this, uh, she's known as Taran Mata, but in fact is a form of the Buddhist goddess Tara, which has been dated to the 8th century. Okay, and we know it's Buddhist. In fact, there's a better image from one article by the, the current um, Gujarat, director of the Gujarat ASI, he, he'd written an article on this place. Um, so this is, this is her revealed, but I mean, the, the, that she's Buddhist is confirmed by the inscription on the bottom, Ye Dharma, uh, what is it, Hetu uh, Prabhavaha, that you always find on, on these kind of images. Um, so that's another location where it might have happened. Now, finally, we're getting to the ridiculous, uh, or the confusing, maybe someone can help me out here. So this, this was last year I went to visit this spot because of, and I think I give you this in the handout as well, but I'll just, I'm going to read this out. Um, <coughs> 
So this is from uh, the Tibetan Taranatha's biography of his guru, Buddha Gupta Natha, who uh, lived in the late 16th century. Okay? And he writes about it. And I don't know if anyone, you know, if anyone studied, I haven't looked in great detail, but I know that Taranatha's uh, histories, while extremely useful, are also rather uh, confusing because they conflate all kinds of things, um, as you will see. <coughs> then in Konkana, so this, is, so this is talking about Buddha Gupta's travels um, all over India and beyond. Then in Konkana, he embarked and went to the west up to an island called Kroling in Sanskrit, Dramala Dvipa. Now, Dramala is generally understood to mean Tamil. It's been, you know, somewhere in the, in the southern region. In the language of the Mohammedans, the barbarians, and the inhabitants of the small island, it is called La Sam La Ra Na So. Now, remember that. Uh, in Sham, Sam Lo Ra Na So. In that island, the teachings of the Guhya mantras are largely diffused. Actually, I won't read this all out. Um, but anyway, he goes there and he learns these various uh, traditions, the sublime, uh, the, the Vajrakala, what is it, the Vajrakila Tantra and the Tantra of the Dasha Krodas, the Heruka Tantras, Vajrapani, and so forth, Marmaki Mahakala, um, and the sublime order of Hayagriva, which is interesting, I hadn't thought about that. Hayagriva crops up a lot in the Sarva Buddha Sama Yoga Dakini Jala Sambara in the context of Hatha Yoga, so maybe there's a connection there. Um, do, 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 do. Though the community is numerous, the rules of the discipline are not so pure. The monks wear black garments and usually drink intoxicating liquors. And then he goes off on his way. Now, so this really intrigued me because, well, it did, you know, this was interesting, but then I came across this reference in Ibn Battuta of this island. Uh, so if we go back, actually, no, I think I've got a map of it afterwards. It's an island called Anjadiva, which crops up a few times. You get a few mentions of this. For, this is the earliest. Uh, and it's this island just off Karwar in uh, northern Karnataka, just south of Goa, where there was a temple with a grove and a reservoir of water. And when we had landed on this little island, we found there a jogi leaning against the wall of a buddhkana, or house of idols. Okay. So I'm wondering, you know, I was wondering whether this was the same place that was referred to by Taranatha. So, uh, sort of wild goose chase went to try and look for it. Now this, there's Anjadeva on this map here, but it's now in the hands of the uh, Indian Navy, and no one's allowed to go there. There's a, there's a church on it, so the local Christians get very annoyed because there used to be an annual festival and they're not allowed to go and visit the church. Um, but it's clear from the various sources recording that the, the church, that the, um, I think there's a, something from 1505 describing the existence of the church. So that's way before Buddha Gupta. Okay, so I assume that that couldn't be the place. So then I started looking at other islands in the region. And in fact, there's one, I think it's, yeah, it's here. Kurumgat, and that had fresh water and stuff. So I thought, right, I'm going to go and check that out. Uh, went off on a boat, and there's nothing there at all. Um, <laughs> there's old Portuguese fortifications. And it turns out that basically the Portuguese took over everywhere at the beginning of the 16th century around there. So there was never going to be any uh, temples left over. Um, and... It then occurred to me that probably what's going on is, and actually Templeman, I, I, I did come to this conclusion myself, but then I've read uh, Templeman's, uh, an article about this as well, and he notes how Lo Sam Lo Ranasso is probably San Lorenzo. Okay. Uh, but there are no churches in this region called San Lorenzo. I have found a reference to a church called San Lorenzo in Goa, which no longer exists. Uh, so that may be what was being talked about. I mean, I, you know, but then it, there's no island on which there's a San Lorenzo. But even to this day, actually, people often talk about Goa as an island, don't they? So maybe someone was getting confused about Goa. Uh, and so <coughs> I think probably the monks wearing black garments and usually drinking intoxicating liquors were Jesuit priests. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, would you be willing to take a few questions? Sure, of course, yeah. If my voice ha holds out. Would you mind going back to your pictures of Uttaranga? And there was the cave where there were 
That's a giant image. Yes, these. These, these ones, okay, yeah. Okay, uh, could, could you have one? You, yes. And what is this place called? This place is called, well, the, the whole area is called Taranga. It's a big hill. No, I, yeah, no, and the, the, the goddess here is called, there's an article by uh, Robert. He's written a little bit about it, where I got the other picture from. But these are now known as the Haran Mata, this one. This the one other, is? The Haran, D-H-A-R-A-N, Mata. Mata. Okay. And the other one's Taran Mata, the one that's clearly Tara. Ta 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 T with a T, the first, so the and ta. Ta. Taran okay. and Taran. And do you have pictures of Taran Mata? Well, yes, these, these were. Okay. That one. Oh, that's the Tara. That's Taran Mata, yeah, 8th century apparently. Okay, and the other was, was the Taran Mata. Yeah. Okay. But it's not a matter. No, no, no. <laughs> is, is, the, is the camera still on? But I think those Can are. You pause the camera for a sec. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, so um, I can't see them very clearly. But mm. in. Uh, I've, got, I've got better pictures, by the way, but I haven't shown them. I, would, I went up closely to it. Okay, well, I would love to see them because sure. some years ago I identified a group of stone Avalokiteshvaras in style and age very close to these in a place that in the Sanskrit text, the <coughs> Nepali Sanskrit text, had been called Tarapura. Tarapura wow. And, uh, and it was then a Jaina shrine. Okay. And this same archaeologist then contacted me about seven years ago that he found those images. This is Robert? Yes. Okay. That he had found those images and they'd been moved into a shrine um, Must be them. It doesn't look well. This could be the third time it's moved. Okay. Actually. Well, because they were in a different. Shrine. They were in a different. The place looked different. Um, <coughs> and so I'm wondering if those. I worked on this 20 years ago, so I don't. But I think my images are simpler. Okay. They were three Avalokiteshvara, <coughs> and Parapura Taranga. I mean the. Hmm, and so this must be part of that same group because they're definitely stylistically very similar and the same age. Great. So well, I've got, I've, got, I've got good close-up pictures of all of these. So if, if, if these aren't my Taras, the yeah. they're actually Avalokiteshvaras, then they must be somewhere around there. Okay. And they were in a cave for a while that was being used for Jaina worship. So yes, there were, there were some other caves on the hill, weren't there, that when we climbed up, that the, ah. the, the, the Jains used them. We okay. didn't, didn't see it, so maybe they've been moved from those to here. Okay, I, I will look now at, at those, at, 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 at <coughs> my images, and what he sent me, and I can share that with you, and then great. maybe you can find them again. Yep. That would sure. be really wonderful. Great. Thank, Thank you. And Thank one you. last question about the clothes. The Lokeshvara that you showed, and the other image is a Manjushri or Manjubhadra or something? Uh, Manjushri. Manjushri. Has, but that, I think that name is only from scholars <coughs> identifying it as Manjushri. Well, whatever. It's yeah. so beautiful. Um, my, my question is oh, a banal oh, art historical question. But when you saw them, oh, are they without clothes? Yeah. And why is that? It seems rather disrespectful, no? Good question. Um, well, they're, they're sort of sidelined. Basically, the priests know they're Buddhist, okay. and they, you know, that's why they're in the eaves, and they're not, they're not sort of, you know, they're not made easily available, or, you know, they're not pointed out to the regular pilgrims. Okay, okay. And in fact, I was asked, so I'm, it, there's, it's quite, the dating is quite sensitive as well, so I've been asked not to write anything yet about the dating for well, some reason. Period. Yeah. 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 And I think, what, uh, talking earlier about, um, my, yeah, my hunch is that perhaps it's a, a maritime connection with, okay. with Tamil Nadu that's they're got them there. They're extremely beautiful. Yeah, they were found. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert. You're an expert. Wonderful. But yeah. I mean, people, people say they're the, the best, you know. Uh, this, is the, so, yeah. this has been often been described as the best. But I just bronze. wondered why they didn't have clothes on, if that indicated that they're not in worship somehow. They're sort of in worship, but not really. Not really. really. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for a fascinating talk. This is really tremendous material. Oh, I'm going to ask you a question about the Buddhist origins of Hatha Yoga. Because um, I worry about this question in a different context with different kinds of materials. Do you see anything okay. in the tantric okay. material, the Buddhist tantric material, okay. that suggests that Hatha Yoga arises from the specific concerns of Hatha Yoga? Or do you think it's more likely, or compared to the sh later Shaiva iterations, 
that for whatever reason, Buddhists felt the need to textualize their practices earlier than Shaivas did? It's a very good question, yeah. I mean, yeah, what did, yeah is the fact that it's written down. Um, again, I'm, you know, I'm really just starting to dip my toes into this world of tantric Buddhism, so it's very, I, I'm you know, wary of, of making any pronouncements. But I think the fact that it's not mentioned at all, as far as we, and, and Shaiva texts have been better researched, I think, up, up to this point than tantric Buddhist texts. Um, and we get no suggestion, you know, the fact that this name Vajroli then comes into later Shaiva Hatha Yoga texts, um, were the, I mean, actually, Shaman's probably quite well, well positioned to have an opinion on this better than I am with this work on the Asiddhara Vrata and so forth, whether that is, is part of this whole tradition. It could be. I mean, I, in fact, I've written saying, suggesting that, uh, the, the, so the Asiddhara Vrata, which um, uh, Shaman Hatley has written an article on, is this, uh, this sort of penance or later becomes a tantric practice in which you, uh, you know, uh, 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 the sadhaka has, has, it has no, just lies with a woman but doesn't, or has sex with a woman, I can't remember. Well, it depends on which iteration. Yeah, yeah which iteration it is, but again, similarly, nothing happens. But generally, in Shaiva Tantric ritual, as I understand it, uh, there's no notion of, of stopping ejaculation. In, it. in fact, often it's necessary because you have to produce the substances then to be used in the, in the ritual. And as far as I'm aware, Shaman again, would, apart from the Asadhara Vrata, which, which disappears, as you show in your article, by the 10th century, is it? Uh, ninth century is already getting downplayed and sort of rejected. As far as I'm aware, within Shaiva traditions, there isn't this notion of of not come, you know, not of the sexual ritual not resulting in, in ejaculation. Um, so yeah, my feeling again, I, I'm, I'm really I'm co I'm convinced that further work, you know, further study of of, of Tibetan texts in particular will be quite revealing and on, on this on this matter. Yeah, so you know, it's def obviously. A, and, I, and I've written elsewhere about how some of these Hatha Yoga practices, you know, we have evidence or suggestions of them going way back and then they only get codified much later on. So it could be that, but it's definitely the, clear that they first get codified within the Buddhist text anyway. So. Yeah, if I could <coughs> just ask a slight follow-up to that. Like another way I'm thinking about that question is, so in Jason Birch's 2011 article, identifying those early tantric Buddhist mentions of hatha yoga and hatha yogena, um, like the Vimala Prabha in this commentary and so forth, but treating hatha yoga as like a last resort practice. Like if the mantras don't work, if you've exhausted every other possibility, okay, then try this hatha yoga stuff. Um, but now you're, you're drawing even more tantric Buddhist materials. It seems like um, there was much more even being codified um, so I'm wondering if your view is expanding on that. Yeah, like it is absolutely. Some of these other texts championing the practice much more. Yes, so. not many, but some. Mo so the just sort of predominant attitude is that it's a, yeah, something of last resort, or something not to be done at all. It's sort of anti-scriptural, but there are some traditions in which it's advocated. Yeah. And then if I could just ask a <coughs> second question. I know you're, you're still going through this material in its initial stages, but if you I'm wondering if how this is changing your views of the development of the Natha Sampradaya. Um, well, I think what we, what we must remember is that you know, we, we use this blanket term Natha Sampradaya, <coughs> but there are all these different lineages that should then come under that, that, uh, that name. Um, for example, so some of these early texts, which we classify as Hatha, but don't call their, their practice Hatha, uh, are attributed to Goraksha Natha, and they're, so the, the, the one of the early texts attributed to him, the Goraksha Shataka, that teaches a, a different body of practice, but within a similar framework, where you have these three bandhas in the Shakti Chalani Mudra, where you yank on the tongue to make Kundalini rise and go through the, the six chakras and so forth. And that seems to be totally independent of this Amaraga Prabodha and this Bindu techniques and so forth. So that would suggest that it's from a a different Nath lineage. I think, yeah, it's, it's uh, and then meanwhile, up in Bengal, we've got the Jalanda and, the, and Kanapa and so forth doing much more extreme tantric stuff, and all these things coalesce into the Nath order later on. So, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think 
the, 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 work, the work to be done is to identify exactly what's going on in these different, different uh, lineages before they all come together. <coughs> Shamos. Thank you, this is very exciting. I have a very quick question. Are, are there any sources that link uh, this Manjunatha figure to Kadali or Kadri that are not local sources, Kannada or, or regionally produced sources? Uh, well, of the Telugu, the Navanatha Charitra, that's the only one I know of, the Sri Shailam one, which says that Manjunata is the son of Matsyendra and the queen of Kadli Desa. This could be a local tradition. I suppose, well, it's then gone there. But what, so what do you, sorry, what's... What? Well, I was just wondering how pervasive this link is, whether there's more than one source, that, and then whether it's a local source. Right. There are, confusingly, there are other Manjunathas around, and there's a place called Dharmasthala, not far from Mangalore, where there's a Manjunatha temple that seems to be completely unconnected. So we went and visited there, but couldn't make sense of that at all, how that would, how that would be connected. Um, there are references to Manjushri as Manjunatha in Southeast Asian traditions, in fact. And, and uh, yeah, so in Andrea Akri's recent volume, there's talk about connections between there and Malabar coast, so maybe there's something, mm. some connection there as well. Mm. Uh, but no, I'm not sure. What it, so the question is, are there any other sources locating Manjunata at Kadli? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, let, if you don't mind, if you let me know what you find with regard to this uh, Mangala <laughs> literature, I'd be very interested. You probably have a better way in than I do. I just. <laughs> I just got. I just came across this obscure. I'm not sure. You know how sometimes you it just come across something. Yeah. I don't remember seeing any country yoga in the yeah. literature, but I'd love to know more. Well, you could probably tell me which. <laughs> I, I'm really have very little idea where to start with that stuff. Well, very interesting. It's definitely worth interesting. <coughs> Thanks. Right, Thank Naomi. Um, you certainly switched around how I think about the lines of influence. You know, uh, which direction. It's coming from, and I've been thinking a lot, or I've been thinking some about how you translate the word bindu. You always translate it as semen, and uh, now that we can bring in the Tibetan perspective, or we might be able to, you know, they typically don't translate it as semen, or certainly not exclusively. It would be taken much more as like essential drop or essence. Mm -hmm. And since in you know the subtle body it doesn't it's you know the way that you're describing it is it's descending from the crown of the head which isn't the normal location of semen so I was just wondering um, like sort of is there any indication from within the knot tradition that it could be translated otherwise or would you be open to Buddhist um, interpretations of that term and other subtle body terms? Certainly, I mean, yeah, I guess I'm being a bit crude by translating it as semen, but I think that, I mean, it does, I mean, there's the, 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 the Hatha Yoga texts go on about Bindu Dharana, you know, holding onto it, restraining it, and you mustn't shed it. So it's clear what they're talking about. But of course, the word Bindu does mean drop, or point, often point of light in earlier Shaiva texts. Uh, so yes, perhaps it's a bit blunt. I mean, and in, fa in fact, when I translated it, when I, when I, you know, when I publish a translation, I just, I just keep it as Bindu, because uh, I think those connotations are, st are still there. But yeah, I'd be delighted to hear more about how Tibetan texts interpret it. And I, yeah, as I say, you know, I think there's, there's lots more to be found out from Tibetan tradition. So will you be looking at I have to, I've got to learn to bet, haven't I? <laughs> 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 well, I'm, I'm hoping Peter's going to help me out with that, <laughs> nudging him. Come on. Yeah. I've got a friend, uh, well, uh, Tim Krog, who's, who's promised me that if I come and spend a month with him, I'll be able to read any Tibetan text at the end of it. <laughs> but I've got to find that month. Yeah. So, um, in the geography you showed us, um, after Kadari, you had this place where you had these temples. And that you had uh, one of the temples with 14, 18 siddhas or 12 siddhas. Yes. So one of the temples you said was a Buddhist, I mean, these caves rather, uh, was first century. Uh, third century. Third century, I think. Yeah. And the siddhas are dated to 14th century? Yes. I mean, I'm just, I'm just taking Deshpande's dates. I'm not, he doesn't say what he bases that on. But so it makes sense to me. So yeah. I was trying to understand the connections that are being implied here. So caves are taken over by successive. 
<laughs> you know, practitioners, and that is, so that's one thing. And the other thing was um, the Kadari, uh, you know, the connection that you made, it's a full, like a lynch, it's a place where apparently a lot of the influences happened, is that what you're implying? And I was wondering. Well, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's the sort of clearest cut place where there was a, the clearest cut instance of a strong tantric Buddhist tradition, and there are in within the the, the, well, the handout of there are, and Peter in okay. fact highlighted a few references to prior to the the date on that statue of of uh, tantric <coughs> well known tantric Buddhist teachers staying or living in in, in Kudli. and then it's clear we then I think the earliest references to Nath yogis there are from the 14th century. There's inscriptions recording the establishment of. Uh, uh, the worship of Goraksha Nata there. So that's the point, you know, what I'm looking for are sites where it's clear. And, and uh, Panhali Kaji, where we have the yeah. third century Hinayana caves, and then we have evidence of Vajrayana Buddhism, and then we have evidence of, of Nath. So I'm just looking for sites where this transition may have occurred. Patton. Hello. Do you, uh, hello. Um, I mean, I think you're kind of deliberately keeping, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the question mark to remain about the nature of that relationship. But I just want to push you if you're willing to, to venture Please, out. Please, yeah. It's all um, work in progress. I need pushing on this. Yeah. yeah do, do you have a, you know, speculations you'd be willing to share about how that transition <coughs> or what the nature of it was if the Nats themselves were were Buddhist or if these were the separate groups or anything along those lines that you... Yeah, I suppose yeah, the, the, the obvious, you know, the sort of Occam's razor answer is that, yeah, the, uh, the traditions of, of Buddhist yogis became not, yeah. Um, how that, I mean, again, this is something, you know, there's a whole world that I'd, I'd really, you know, I'd need to catch up on fast. And, you know, I still don't really, I don't, you know, why did, why did the Buddhist traditions die out there? What, what was going on? I, you know, I, it's a... This is only going to be an article. I'm going to keep restrict. I'm going to try not to draw too too big conclusions on this <coughs> yet. Uh, but hopefully, people who are better versed in the field might be able to use this information to answer the bigger questions. Yeah. Well, just following up on that, then, does any of this kind of early Hatha Yoga um, research you're doing affect your argument at all about kind of later Hatha Yoga when you talk about it kind of being very very much a rejection of of the tantric um, kind of um, the elitism of tantra and making these yoga practices more accessible to to more people is there does this inform that at all or it's kind of that that still holds true I think that still holds true but again you know there are differences between lineages uh, and there are you know there are so if we go if you look at that list of texts I gave that teach how to yoga so within the say the, the Shiva Sangita for example does does uh, teach various mantras, Sri Vidya mantras, to go with Hatha Yoga practice and so forth. Uh, but generally, yeah, I've got some new new theories about the productions of the text, which I'm not going to go into now. But um, yeah, I think it still holds forth that they're trying to kind of universalize the practices. Whether what I'm not sure about is whether people actually did take them up. You know, people were told anyone can do this, but I'm not sure that many people did. I just want to make a comment you know, regarding that lady's question. I think after all, uh, we are approaching an Eastern philosophy. I myself look at ancient languages. So I think, especially in the realm of religion, uh, the language itself is purposefully made complete, I mean, blurred. The blur it is, the more technique it shows that the person has. It is not to define one thing, it is to jam a lot of things in one word. So if we keep trying to define one thing very precisely, <coughs> it actually go the other direction. Thank, I think you're absolutely right, particularly in the context of these tantric Buddhist texts. I mean, as I say, I'm only just starting to, to work on them. But there, I mean, my colleague Peter, who's you know, sp spent a long time working on them, he you know, he would say exactly the same thing. They're deliberately very obscure and, and confusing. So, yeah, there's only so, you know, one shouldn't try too hard to make sense of them. Uh, so the way you, you say is, is, is semen, it actually works. Because in some context, yeah. For us, in the yeah. Taoism uh, tradition, it is understandable. For okay. us, it works. 
and then uh, also, uh, I'm not going to work on this, but I also I also want to say that you know the control group of the definition is very powerful. Yes, and I've I've looked into that a bit in my article on this <coughs> early mid-run practice. I looked in it a little bit, but just again, you know. Uh, but yes, I mean, I've, and w I can't help but wonder whether. These practices may have come from those traditions. If yeah. there is communication to the north, they should go through the south. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Robinson? I mean, I have thousands of questions, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to limit you but, to uh, two more sides. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a minor one, but um, previously, um, you had been arguing that the Dattatraya Yoga Shastra is the first text to teach the methods of Hatha Yoga and to name it as such. But I noticed in this list you have the Amarauga Prabodha as coming earlier. Coming yeah. earlier, and I'm wondering if there was something that you s you've seen recently that shifted the dates of those texts. Yeah, you you noticed. Well done. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, but it's nothing nothing definite. I might. I mean. Uh, that list of the Tantric Buddhist texts, the, the, the scholars on Tantric Buddhism seem more confident in the dates of those texts than I certainly seem about the dates of the, of the Hatha Yoga texts. This is something that we're working on, you know, uh, we're editing the Amaraga Prabodha as part of the project. And there's the terminus post quem of it is the, is the Amrita Siddhi, basically, of the short recension. The longer recension is probably way later, possibly 16th. Jason's writing an article, we've written an article about this right now. <coughs> it, was, it was ready, ready to go. I think. Um, so yes, it could be considerably earlier. But yeah, we've you know there's quite big uh, ranges for most of these texts at the moment. Okay. But nothing like um, within the text itself. That was a kind of <coughs> aha moment where you realized, oh, this is this is prior to the Dattatreya. No, no. There's nothing between the. Two, I don't think to yeah to say that one's later than the other. So yeah, it could have been either way around in that list. And it's not clear that they influence each other, although they they because they both mention these that somehow they've come out of the the Amrita Siddhi, but it's not clear that they were connected in any way. I this is um, a related kind of technical question on the um, list of the texts. I noticed that you had dated the Shiva Samhita slightly earlier to the 15th century, but I know in your critical edition you had, it was somewhat later, maybe 17th or 18th century? Uh, no, that would be the Geranda Sangita, I put much okay. later. But so there's some debate, I mean, Jason, I think, is, worked, is, is working on the Shiva Sangita at the moment, and he thinks that in the form we have it now, maybe as late as 17th, 16th, 17th century, but bits of it, the, the bits of it are borrowed by the Hatra Pradipika, but not all of it, and it's, you know, a lot of these, these texts are all composite, so it's quite, quite hard to be definitive about, well it's easier to be definitive about when the, when it, the form in which we have it, but bits of it seem to be probably older than the Hatha Pradipika, but anyway, let's wait for Jason's R. He, he, whenever I say it's 14th or 15th century, he says, no, no, it's later. Than that, so. <laughs> Great, well if we have, it sounds like you need to rest your yeah. voice, so please Talk join me in thanking well. Dr. Mel.